Um, evening everyone, thank you so much for coming to Hearts Books this evening. Um, we really pride ourselves on being a community bookshop and it's, it's very much the community, that, the support of the community that's made us um, what I hope is a great bookshop. And uh, it's doing of evenings like tonight which, which hopefully make us quite a special place to, to be. Uh, I always like to think of us as a hub of um, knowledge and education and it's fantastic to get uh, so many talented young people in here this evening. Um, I'm going to hand over to Paul and I just want to say to Paul, he's been a customer from since day one and an avid supporter and I really think it's characters like yourself, Paul, that put themselves into the community, um, that make the difference to not just Saffron, you know, to the Saffron Warden community and it's um, I think we need more figures like you up and down the country. So when you're all famous filmmakers <laughs> and poets and writers, remember Paul in your biography. So I, think he does a <laughs> I think he does a terrific job um, with Creative Warden. And uh, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. <laughs> of course, we have a massive team as well. We've got Lee and Roy are here as well, and Alfie. We've got Izzy doing the camera. We've got Lucas as well doing the camera. So um, our first um, session will be from Sam Parker. The tree stands alone in a barren field. Leaves flutter down from its long, outstretched branches. Grass rustles in the wind, calming the mind and ensnaring the senses. It is a place of peace providing retreat from the constant busyness of life. The falling of the leaves, the swishing of the grass, and the sound of silence, each calm and help all to reach a state of mindfulness and content. This is a place far from life, death, and even time. This is a place that sparks imagination and lives forever. This is true happiness, being calm and content, being at peace in that barren field, always knowing that, no matter what, you can eternally seek this place of refuge under the tree. Strong winds lash at trees, and dark clouds swirl in the sky. A storm is coming. Rain and hail batter the damp earth, while lightning slashes through the dark sky. People cower in their homes, fearing fearsome storms' deadly rage. The piercing gales uproot trees and destroy buildings. There is nowhere to run from it, nowhere to hide. This is no ordinary storm. This is a tempest. Even the ocean is no safe place to be, as the mighty storm whips up waves the size of mountains, upturns boats with ease. The storm's anger only builds with time. It unleashes its fury on the world with great force. The winds increase, as does the pattering rain. More streaks of lightning mark the barren, cloudy sky while the storm rages on. And the lights shine like stars, a welcome distraction from pollution and cars. Smothered in baubles, it is quite a sight, its beauty more than makes up for its height. An angel sits at the top with a beautiful smile. Christmas is coming and in the meanwhile, I can stare at my tree, bring of chocolate and candy canes too. There's never been such a tree, well maybe a few. There's more than one, there's more than one Santa, but none of them mind, though the elf shoes are certainly one of a kind. A robin sleeps soundly in his cosy new home. The owners of this tree have no reason to moan. 
There's baubles and trinkets from Greece, Rome and Spain, reflected so clearly in their window pane. The lights seem to dance, and if you see it, then you will know that Christmas is coming. No reason to fear, everything's merry and full of good cheer. The presents are piling up, we stroke them with glee. All of us wonder, what can it be? This one is long and this one is short. Well, whatever it is, it was a nice thought. I can't wait for that look on my brother's face. I know what he'll say. He'll say, Jean, this is ace. Maybe outside it's icy and cold, but I'm in the warm, surrounded by red, green and gold. Allow me to recount to you a tale about Gary. Gary is a super duper <laughs> posh whale made millions from seaweed farms, but his money wasn't making him happy. He wanted an adventure. He reflected one day as he relaxed in his super modern luxury mansion. Could he know that fate already had an adventure in store for him? Oh yes, my children, an adventure indeed. <laughs> it was a Tuesday like any other. Gary was sipping a cold kelp smoothie when suddenly he glanced at his newspaper. It reported the breaking news that Gary had just been robbed of his fortune. This was a sign he had been waiting for. He decided to get off his big fat whale butt and, and do something about this tragic event. Today he would finally sort, out, sort his life out. Chicken nuggets can't dance, shouted Gary as he ran off in search of his true destiny. Identity. It was a bizarre thing to shout, but Gary sadly once had a traumatic encounter with, a ch with chicken nuggets who thought they could dance. So he says that sometimes. There was no time to waste, so he didn't pack any bags or get dressed. He just ran outside completely naked. But that's okay, because whales are just <laughs> because whales are completely naked most of the time. His mustache blowed in the wind and blew in the wind as he swam his, to his destiny. <laughs> Once there lived an ordinary purple spider called Greg. Greg wasn't the brightest of spiders, but he was very amusing to watch. One day Greg decided he was he wanted to be a butterfly. So he marched out of his small hole in the tree and scuttled off to the nearest shop. You see, Greg thought that to become a butterfly you only needed to have a pair of wings made from frozen butter. So he decided to go and buy all the butter from his local supermarket, Buzzco. Once he had arrived at the checkout, Greg piled on, a bucket, piled on his bucket load of butter. He waited for the cashier to scan all the butter. Once he'd paid for it, Greg went to his local wing makers and bought himself some wings. Greg decided to drown these wings in all the butter he bought, then freeze it. As he was walking as he was walking home all smug, wearing his butter wings, he heard a voice come from nowhere. Oi, called the voice. Are they butter wings? Yes. Why, yes they are, answered Greg. Well, try him out, uh, try him out then, commanded the voice. Greg looked around for the source of the voice and he found it. Floating in a puddle was a leaf, which had a face. How odd, thought Greg. Okay then, I said Greg, I jolly well will. Following, following the request from the leaf thing, Greg climbed up, to the, climbed up the tree elegantly and stood at the very top of the branch. <laughs> the branch swayed in the, in the breeze, but, sway, but, sw but the swaying wasn't violent enough to unbalance Greg. He looked down at the ground and saw a small dot and smiled. The dot was the leaf thing. Greg bounced three times as if on a diving board. He leaped gracefully into the air and to his disbelief and great surprise, his wings didn't work. Remember right at the start of the story I told you that Greg wasn't the brightest, wasn't the brightest of spiders? Well, this was his least brightest moment. <laughs> as, as he was plummeting down, he felt a swift a swift wind grabbed him, and then came darkness. Where was Greg? All he knew that he was flop he wasn't falling anymore. Greg wasn't falling, he was flying. But he was flying inside a bird. As Greg began to panic As Greg began to panic, he saw a small opening beneath him. It was his lucky day. He fell out of the hole and looked down. He was going to land in his house. An hour later it takes an hour for a tiny spider to fall from a great height. He was safe at home and in bed because he had actually broken four of his eight legs. So, 
in the end, what did we learn? Well, we learned to never listen to weird to what weird leaf things say, even if they even if they notice your new butter wings. <laughs> 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 I will put in my box the last words from my great grandmother, the tears from my mother's eyes, the dancing fire in my father's eyes. I will put in my box love from a homeless man to a dog, the memories of the past, the sweet smell of my mother's f freshly baked bread. I will put in my box the love of my family to cherish forever, the broken heart of my sister, the flowing streams of pain. I will put in my box the precious purse of my old cat, the happiness of family and friends, the last beats of my great-grandmother's great heart. I love my cat, because that's where I'm at. She never once caught a rat, because she's a little bit fat. I like to give her a pat, although she rips up the mat. She is a humongous prat, but never a brat. I wouldn't trade her for a money-filled vat, because I love my cat, and that's where I'm at. Bob was a man who loved the National Lottery. He spent over a thousand pounds on it already that month, and it was only the third day. As you may have noticed, he was spending a thousand pounds every three days, and now he was broke, very broke. In fact, he only had ten pounds left in the bank account. He went to the bank and got his tenner out. Bob sat down on the bench to think about how he was going to spend it. It was a blustery day. Suddenly, the ten pound note blew away. No, he shouted, come back! It was no use. The £10 note had disappeared into the night. He sat down, sobbing into his hands. He felt numb. Now he had no money at all. Hang on. Glinting through the snow and lit by the moonlight, was a shiny £2 piece. Bob looked left. He looked right. There was nobody there. The £2 coin was his. The lottery ticket cost £1.50. Maybe, just maybe, he was saved. One lottery ticket, please. Absolutely, sir, said the shopkeeper. Bob went the, into the street and through a window saw a couple sitting on their sofa watching the daily lottery on TV. He's just in time for the draw with a £200 million prize. First number, five, said the presenter. Yes, said Bob. First number, five. Two hundred million might be mine. Second ball is seven. Yes, four. Yes, three. Yes. He only needed one more number, number nine. The final ball is nine. Yes, 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 yes. People stared, but he didn't care. Not even about the disgruntled couple seeing what looked like a laughing madman at the window, shouting yes over and over again. <laughs> As you're reading this, Bob is relaxing in a huge £10 million mansion, counting his money. Maybe he's having caviar and toast, or pouring a £100 bottle of vintage champagne on his cornflakes. Or maybe he's playing netball with the lottery friends he met at news newsagents. Or he could be playing basketball on a court made out of pure gold. Whatever he's doing, you can be sure he's buying lottery tickets every night, 300,000 of them. Poor Mr Newsagent. So basically, every week, he gains £1.4 billion. So yeah, he's really, really super rich. £1.4 billion times 52 weeks in a year? A lot of longer. He's si seriously rich. I'd say he's about to £1 trillion by now, but it was pure luck. Maybe he'll go the same way as Bob. Well, probably not. There's more of the chance of you being hit by lightning than winning the lottery. But that one in a million chance might be possible. Hang on a minute, I'm breaking the fourth wall. Hey reader, 20 quid so he's reading this with socks on. Okay, okay, back to the hero of our story, the man, Bob. Bob does give to charity, just £100 per month in total. Hang on, something's happening. Bob is sitting in a private five-star first-class drummer jet. Oh, wait, the engine's on fire. He's crashing. Oh, no, the plane is plummeting 3,000 feet from the sky. 2,100, oh, no, 10 feet, crash. Is Bob okay? Oh, no, he's dead. Bob didn't have an heir. Yay, his trillion-pound fortune is being shared out between charities, the homeless and the poor. That's nice. Maybe he was kind after all. Well, a moral lesson. Always be nicer than a news agent. Oh, and don't gamble. <laughs> the moon. The moon hangs in the sky like a misty curtain. Its brightness tells many stories. Tales of the past and chapters of the future. The moon glows down at the world, lonely in the velvet sky, uncertain of what to do. The stars sprinkled in the sky like hundreds and thousands of glitter, hiding untold mysteries. Soon the summer will return, and the world will run like clockwork again. Softly, silently, gently, I crept across the open field, the snow crunching under my feet like fallen leaves in autumn. Stealthily, I edged through the open expanse, my heart thump, thump, thumping away in my chest, so fast that I felt that it was going to explode. Quickly now, I must venture on if I'm going to escape him in time. Running blindly through the storm I stumbled on, 
the, ha the hail lashing at my face while the merciless ice winds were howling away. This screeching sound seemed so loud it pierced my very soul. Everything went quiet and there was a ringing sound in my ears, out of focus images of the landscape blurred into one. The colours swelled, the gr endless grey expanse ahead of me loomed threateningly towards me, as if it was torturing me, mocking me, all alone in a cruel world with no one to turn to. Whilst running, I saw a forest ahead of me. It was dark and I thought that the forest might offer me a chance of escaping him. At last I found myself in the refuge of a dense set of trees and I continued running, running on and on into the silent dark forest. All was calm except for the crunching and rustling of the leaves beneath my feet and the sound of my heart beating. My breath was warm against my cold skin and I could feel the cold sweat running down my face and back. I glanced behind and I could just catch him in the corner of my eye, a dark figure pursuing me. His skate was staggered and he had a crazed look in his eye. He looked as if his whole body had been overcome with a madness, and I just knew he would stop at nothing until he got what he wanted. Me. I knew that he wanted to kill me. I could tell by the look in his eye, this really was the end for me. I was going to die soon, all alone. No one would miss me. My death would be unaccounted for. I was just a number after all. Just another person missing from a cold and indifferent world. Everyone would move on and, there, and they would notice I'm gone as much as they noticed I was there. In a strange way, I felt that death would come as a welcome break from life. It could not come soon enough. It was pointless going back home. I'd have to deal with my mother, who was mentally ill, my abusive father. All my life, um, I'd never known love. And my thinking was that if I died, at least I wouldn't have to endure the suffering anymore. I felt calm knowing that it not it wouldn't be too long but I'd be able to I'd be able to be at peace. I could no longer see him through the darkness. My heart was pounding as I dashed towards the hollow tree trunk. I crouched down, my ankle brushed against the cold earth. In the tree in the tree trunk the air inside smelt damp and the wood had started to rot. I sat there shivering and afraid. I was sure the end was near. Suddenly his face emerged from the darkness. He had an evil glint in his eye. Quickly and stealthily, he pulled a knife from his pocket and the blade glinted in the moonlight. He started circling the small coppice of trees where I was hiding, always on the prowl, searching for me. I sat there in the tree trunk, with my heart pounding out of my chest. It was only a matter of time before he spotted me. My head was starting to spin and I began to start seeing things, things that weren't really there. I saw dead animals hanging from the trees around me, their bodies rotting slowly away. It looked like they had been there for a while, for there was a trail of dried blood encrusted on the bark, trickling down the trunk. I noticed that lying around me, um, there were broken glass bottles and needles. Perhaps this was a place where other people came to in order to escape from everything. I opened my eyes and I could see him advancing towards me. Our eyes met and locked for a split second. That moment seemed to go on for eternity. Soon, however, that moment was over and he advanced towards me once again. This really was the end now. The time had come. As he came towards me, I found the hairs on my arms were standing up in fear and I was shaking. I was terrified, but at the same time, adrenaline was surging through my veins. Finally, he had reached my hiding place. With a look that could only be described as pure evil and merciless glee, he raised his arm, holding a knife that was pointing right towards my heart. I tried to scream, but no sound came out. I sat, I sat crouched there on the ground, locked in fear. I glanced up for the last time and saw the knife descending towards me. Just at that moment, my heart gave way and I was whisked away from that terrible scene. Instead, before me, I saw a landscape of pure white without a single object in sight. I glanced around the calm scene and wondered if this was heaven, whatever it was. It was peace at last. I was thankful that I had been given a second chance at life, even if it wasn't one on earth. At last, I was able to escape from all the suffering I had experienced in my previous life. It was time for me to live my life again and I was going to make most of it this time. Nothing or no one could get, to, get in my way. This was my time. I took a few shaky steps forward, then stopped, took a deep breath and started forwards, and I didn't glance back at once. I was on the road to something new and exciting. My life was beginning, and I couldn't wait for it to start. <laughs> Swaying back and forth in my head, I think in my chair. I'm rehearsing the scripts on the structure of a plant. I think I'm remembering the religious context of how to work out the error of a circle. 
pie something something. I'm tired, I'm hungry. Stepping over books written upside down, the clock on my wall was written in 24 hours. Strange. I remember Shakespeare was doing during 2012. Bankruptcy means getting the basketball through the hoop. No food. What's the recipe for mayonnaise? Ich bin French. No. Je suis German. No. I'm English. Correct. Back upstairs, my eyes scanned the floor for useful things. Scanning, 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 sleep. Awake, like a rocket. Pen, pencil, notes, coloured posters, caffeine giving me energy. What else do I need? A hacksaw, useful for hacking off my hands. That'll get me out of it, surely. One o'clock. Oh God, I'm so tired of GCSEs. Must keep revising. I wake up, warm, snug, comfy and cosy. Sunlight shines through. A lovely day to begin. I should actually start revising now, I think. Maybe tomorrow. I am the flame. Do not say you want to fix me, for I am not broken. I am still the meaning in these words. I am still the small shine of sun upon the frostbitten snow. I am still the hope that breaks into the crisp of dawn with every rising day. Do not tell me I am still broken. I am still the rose that grew from the rain. I am still the heart that beats despite the pain. I am still the bruise that lingers day to day. Do not tell me I am the shell of a girl I used to be. Some days I am the dark room and the four walls that never fade. But I am also the candle that floods this room with light. I am the courage that lurks on restless nights. I am the flame that burns despair into ash and weakness into fight. It's Wednesday night and my blood is pumping. The words in my veins flow from pain to paper, brain to paper. An hour and a half to release a week of potential poetry, we choose to rise above the mediocrity. Because to be creative is to be courageous. Thank you, Creative Warden, for giving me the choice, for giving me the voice. It's Wednesday night. Let us unite and let us write. As you can tell, we've got some wonderful talent. Um, based at Ferrycroft House. Big round of applause for all our writers.